thank you all for coming here, spending the time to participate in this process. I extend that thanks with my co-presenters, Aiden O'Mara with Joan Kling and Sal, and Robert Brown with Perkins and Will. Um, one of the things we think is any good project begins with a lot of listening, and quite frankly, a combination of outreach and research. And this process is a little unique in the fact that it's a public process, but at the end of the day, we felt that we needed to dig in a lot of sources, including the Public for Project Places Market Feasibility Study, feedback from the neighborhood that we gained, the Haymarket Pushcart Association, um, and the overall Beacon Hill and Extended Neighborhoods that participate in this. What I think we're going to present is that we hope that we heard you, and we heard at least what we could gather as far as the key information. And some of our key goals coming out of this project were to fulfill the market district plan, which plays a vital role in the food distribution system for Boston. Um, second one was that we achieved not one push cart being displaced, and that we, in addition, created a headquarters for the HPA, which would allow for organization in a cohesive, a cohesive market environment. Um, we also look to complement the neighborhood. We feel that our use as a hotel is a very public use, and for that, it should have public spaces for all to gather and to use. We felt we needed to be respectful of the Greenway and create an ability to also have a 24-7 eyes on the park. Um, and at the end, we feel that we need a viable plan that actually will allow us to successfully permit, finance, and develop the project. Uh, we believe all of these are summed up in our goal, which is the creation of a diverse, world-class public market space. Um, with that, I'm going to turn over to Eamon, who's going to speak about some of the core pieces that we built into the project. Thank you. Uh, my name is Eamon O'Mara with Jones Lang LaSalle. Good evening. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, based on what we heard uh, and the goals, we defined what we see as six primary principles for the development and the guiding of our planning and execution of the project. <coughs> this project truly is about the marketplace. And the first step in that process is preservation, the preservation of the Haymarket Pushcart Association. The Pushcart Association has deep roots that date back to the 1800s, and we feel that our plan preserves that by not displacing any pushcart locations. We adhere to the original intent of the market district plan set forth by the city. The vendor locations currently are laid out in three rows one, two, and three. These locations have been, are territorial and have been established for uh, 70 years. And we feel that those, the non-displacement of any location is important as a moving forward process. With any good project, the foundation is the most important piece of a project. And with this foundation, solving the hay market and solving our, our ground floor market as complementary to parcel seven is that first step. To achieve that, we've moved the third row of vendors <coughs> towards our building to create a 20-foot fire lane down Blackstone Street. And then in addition, we provided the base of operations for the Haymarket Pushcart Association. Furthermore, the Blackstone Street will be leveled and made curbless to ease of operation. And in this section, you can see the overhang is created. We've, put a, we've created an eight-foot setback within our building to allow for vendor and public access. That string dimension across the street allows the maintenance of the eight foot, eight foot vendor, plus the 10, plus the 20 foot fire lane prescribed by the city, plus the eight foot vendor lane in lane three. <clears throat> Beyond the ground floor and the important resolution of the Haymarket Pushcart Association improvements, it's really about a complementary use. And we feel that the hotel is a truly a public space that complements the market. We will not only improve and expand the HPA operations and the interrelationship with Parcel 7, this project will serve as a civic anchor for the north and its surrounding neighborhoods. Hotels are truly public spaces, and this will allow public access, access throughout the development. The market experience will change and increase with expansion and organization. Diversity of offerings to neighborhoods and visitors. The quality of life will be improved with the promotion of affordable fresh food offerings. Oh. 
Um, one of the other important components we felt was to ignite uh, the public activity on the Greenway within the overall market district. Um, this will allow the local economy to be bolstered with the creation of jobs, including um, in the retail and then within the hotel project. Um, it will make the streetscape lively. It's going to expand the market, and we're going to bring in complementary food specialty items that will work with what's originally based on the Pushcart Association. We also feel it's important, and Robert get into this a little more on the design, of how this project has connectivity, and you can work your way through it, and that allows connections to Faneuil Hall, the North End, the Financial Districts, and Beacon Hill. Um, we also feel hospitality is a place to gather, and that merit matches right up with what the market district should be. It becomes the market hub of the activity. It's going to allow to enliven the culture around it. Food will bring us all together, both the food from the market district, the food from the restaurants, and what we will produce in the shops. Uh, and that community resources will be available. We're going to include a community center that's going to be available for the community to meet and use uh, as required. Um, but in the end, it's all about placemaking. And our goal was to create an iconic public place for everyone to enjoy, create permanent jobs, which will boost the economy, create a rebounded local food economy and a community life around it, and then create a model district, a model market district for others to follow. And I think with that, we look at it, the Haymarket Square Hotel is a truly public place. It's going to be activated and open 24-7, 365 days a year. It includes the different components, including the hotel, the specialty food shop, the winter garden, the community center, the meeting space, the restaurants. And I think in the end, our hope was that this hotel is a common ground that creates an inviting, safe, and lively public place that attracts a diverse range of people. And at this point, I think I'd like to turn it over to Robert Brown, our architect, who's going to get into some of the real key components of the project and how we were to develop it. Hey, thank you. <clears throat> well, we love this quote from James Beard. Food is our common ground, a universal experience. And nothing could be more universal than when you rounded a haymarket, you see the food, you see the diversity of the food, the diversity of the economic uh, group from tourists, business people, neighbors, those who have come in from the trains to, to really take advantage of what this place is about. And so the design of this building is about the market. It's all about the market. It's about that ground plane, the activity that we can create and generate. And then the way that we can enhance this is by having a community that can come in and enjoy the publicness of the market, the publicness of the hotel, and really enliven that area as it has been enlivened for so many years. But it sort of bring, goes us back to that common ground. There's a central place, it's an amazing location within our city, where it was once sitting underneath the uh, artery, it is now on the edge of a fantastic park, particularly the North End Park, the rest of the Greenway. It's right on the edge of the, of the uh, Freedom Trail, and so that we have tourists and everyone else walking past and engaging in what is the, one of the most historic uh, and most exciting uh, pieces of live history that we can have. It's connected to each of the inner uh, neighborhoods, and then by transportation, as you all know, Green Line, Red Line, Blue Line, uh, North Station, you're, you can reach almost every community in the city of the LA region. Okay. But there's, a, a, there's already a market district that exists. There's a district that is centered with Haymarket, with Blacks, Blackstone Square, the Haymarket and Parcel 9, the new designation of Parcel 7 for that, for that market activity. Faneuil Hall and this historic <laughs> retail uh, that started off as uh, small businesses and now is much more of a touristy area, but very popular, very important to both the success of this and the success of the city. Government Center finally figuring out what to do with that plaza and having activities like the circus and Cirque du Soleil and, and Peter Pan and other things. The North End, my neighborhood, where there's tremendous eating, shopping, community activity. And then finally, both. Uh, Bullfinch Triangle with the sports activities. And what we find is that it's not just the, the neighbors themselves, but there is active retail in every location. So all these little triangles are front doors. No front, no, probably no street, even Newbury Street doesn't have as many front doors as there are on this street uh, with Faneuil Hall, Hanover, and Salem Street. And the connections, just imagine, all the way, the ability to, as we never worked took before, to walk through Hanover Street. To be able to connect through 
uh, from City Hall Plaza down to Faneuil Hall. And the yellow squares are really sort of the push cart activity. Certainly started in Haymarket, but it's grown. It exists in Faneuil Hall. It exists in the farmer market that's on Government Center. It can exist on the north end. And why is that? Because it <coughs> provides us flexibility and change and a dynamic community. Next. So what we see within Haymarket is it's this, it's this place about being fresh and dynamic. It has to be flexible because what is going on today will be changed as we move forward. And for me, it's very ritualistic. I went down to that market every single week for the first five years I lived here. It was just something that you did, and many of us do that today. And it's about being local, and it's about being diverse. And so within the plan, we've tried to respond to all those things. So we're going to take a little bit slower to find what are those program pieces. And just for orientation, this is the surface artery. That's the park, North Street. Faneuil Hall is down in this corner, parcel seven, the Blackstone Block. And so we've got a kind of funny little site, a little triangle that has this unique point uh, that's out of the front. And so that unique point is a Solomon Yard of some sort, stuff where there's really more, uh, lots of varied uh, foods. There's retail that's going to surround that, uh, the, the building, as well as complement the retail that exists already, so that in a the, in the sense, all the retail is looking on to Blackstone Street as an active, uh, transient uh, location. We'll talk about the uh, HPA storage and dumpster, and it's sort of the funniest thing to talk about, but it is the key to success. If we don't s solve that problem, we don't have a viable market, or what we have is what it is today. It's, it's really <coughs> a difficult place to do. And we've created a winter garden, a place where we can be inside and outside at the same time, two-story in height, on the west side, so we're getting great sun in and community spaces up above. Next. So if we just break some of the, the, the pieces down, an important part is the public accessibility. That This is not a building that you don't go into. This is a building that is for this community. It has connections through the Winter Garden. It has connections north and south through the space. And the retail is thread through that. And we're hoping that it's, as one walks through and buys their vegetables and everything else, you really start doing a weaving pattern and really making it a total experience. It's just not a one-way traffic scene. <laughs> and then there's that retail. Off that public area is huge blocks of pieces that are, that are there. And one thing we've been thinking about is, well, is all of this related to food? Is it is about cutlery? Is it about pots and pans? Is it about linens? Is it about bookstores that are talking about food? Is it about cafes and, and um, uh, traffic story? It's all about that activity that can be there room through the winter garden, round the perimeter edge, and accessible from both inside and outside. So on great market days, the doors are wide open, very much like you see in uh, Pier 4 in San Francisco. And then there's the clarity of we, we really need, and we've worked very hard to make sure that we understand what are the needs of HPA. Uh, originally, the RP was talking about three dumpsters, I think, in, with communication with them, is realizing that if we really had four dumpsters, a single location, that we can sort of manage the produce, compact it, and then have it go away on the Sunday so that we're not coming in and out. The ability, hopefully, for the road to be two ways so that if we want to come in and go back out North Street or come in and go up Hanover Street, we're able to do that. The storage, as anyone was saying, storage so that we can get an awful lot of the equipment stored on site so trucks don't have to come in and out every single uh, Thursday and Sunday. And key to that is flattening out the road so that the road is no longer having to be boxed up by crates to get a level platform and then uh, taken down so that the, hopefully that is a major piece that, that is gone. And what you'll see in some of the renderings is that every 30 feet we're planting stanchions, probably 20 foot high poles that would have at the base would be power, water, lighting, and the ability to stretch a singular canvas across five minutes. Okay. <laughs> um, in addition to that ground plan, ground plan, we also have community spaces on the second floor, the pool, the meeting rooms, fitness areas, all that are potentially available for the community. The hotel itself is on four floors. And on the very top, a roof deck with a roof garden. In section, you can see that very same 
mentioned, there's the winter garden, hotel rooms, the retail, black stone. And when you look at it, we really see it as a tying into the greenway. The green of the roof, the green space, the connection of parcel 7 and parcel 9. And if we look a little bit closer, we just remind ourselves of that program. The market plan off, to the, off the back of the cross connections to the building. The retail that's on the lower level and on the roof. That public space that connects all those together with direct access to the community room, the hotel. And then finally, the sky gardens that are there as part of the sustainable project. And so when you look down, it really almost disguises itself and becomes a part of that greenway activity. You see the recreation, of, I mean, the, uh, the stalls. But it's all about the ground plane. The ground plane, the activation of that space, the identification of what is Haymarket, the stanchions we were talking about, the flexibility that we can extend into Parcel 7 as well as we are in Parcel 9. Being inside the atrium, being able to look out and, and see the fresh meats and vegetables that are here, the, the market that's having an active space, having a coffee inside or outside is part of what makes this public. And then the, the end at North, at, uh, North Street, where you really are connecting to the bracketing of the new building and the Millennium Hotel. And all about sort of community and gathering and coming together. Is, this, is the, this is that winter garden that's in asking you to come in and participate in the hotel. I think quickly, just at the end of the day, it's all about delivery. If we don't have a plan that we execute on, then it's not going to happen. Um, we feel that we've basically created a world-class public market destination with the hotels and element of that. We think we could fill the Boston Market District plan. We complement the neighborhood. We're respectful of the presence on the Greenway. We're sustained. We've created a sustained and improved hay market operation. And we have a credible plan to successfully permit, finance, and develop the project. Real quickly, um, the sponsorship, Normandy Real Estate Partners, advised by JLL with the architecture of Perkins and Wilts. We're built on a foundation of respect, <coughs> preservation, financial strength, and local experience. We approach things as stewards. When it was with the Ames Hotel, a historic rehab, that was something we needed to go in, embody the history, keep it consistent, but then take it to a new modern use, which has created an enlivened hotel, and it's been a great foundation for an anchor of the downtown crossing neighborhood with the John Hancock. That was something where we were <coughs> called upon to stabilize the asset, to actually reposition it, make a $50 million investment, but at the same time, we respected the history and the identity that Cobb had created in that asset. Um, I think with that, um, we're very appreciative of your time. We're hopeful to get into some questions. And we'll go from there. Thank you. All set. One minute before I, um, we're gonna, as I said, we'll start with the advisory committee and then I'll open it up to the public. Um, I just want to acknowledge, and just like at last meeting, um, Matt Conti from NorthamWaterfront.com is here and he is taping this and it will be live on, we play it again on NorthamWaterfront.com um, as he does with many of the public meetings in the neighborhood so that the neighbors who could not make it will get a chance to see the presentation. So thank you, Matt, and I just want to let people know that. Also, I want to acknowledge Maria Popolo from Representative Michaelowitz's office is here with us tonight too. So, so I'm going to start with the advisory committee. I'll work uh, left to right. So they're sitting in the back there tonight. So, well, there's nothing to say. Well, I, I have to tell you, you came out right away, and I compliment you on answering the 20 foot uh, filing uh, situation. So I'll, I'll come up with some questions to it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my question is a little bit different. Uh, I was struck both in your oral presentation and in the written material by the absence of any motor vehicles in the illustrations. And that raised for me a fairly significant question, which is how you will deal with drop-off, pick-up, taxi, and related issues for the hotel, particularly since it obviously has to be handled on the Greenway side. I will not mention any names, but there are other hotels on the Greenway that have essentially succeeded where they don't have off-street loading facilities in 
capturing the street, the sidewalk, and everything else, not just for drop off and pick up, for short term parking and everything else. And if that were to happen in this environment, because of the critical connection between Parcel 9, the Greenway, the North End, that would be a serious issue. So could you address how you see that working? Your, your neighboring hotel has a, an off street drop, in, drop off, uh, off and, and pick up. You don't. How would you deal with that issue? Sure. And we, we learn a lot from the Ames Hotel, just as a real quick piece. That's at the end of State Street and Court Street, very high level of traffic in and out. That has no carve out and a curve cut. That's simply a valet operation. We would essentially approach this in the same way. We have talked to arrangements about Dock Square Garage, 28 State Street, 60 State Street. We've dug in with a couple of the valet operators that we've worked with before. We've been very successful, and I think BTD had the hugest, had the largest concern about that hotel was on, on the Ames. Are you going to create a traffic jam? How are you going to manage it? And we've been very successful in a 24 hour environment being able to do that, and including, which we don't have the advantage here, of having to do all of our loading and unloading of all of the food, beverages, et cetera, coming in on street. Where this, we will have the opportunity because we have a separate dock to address that component. So, yeah, I'd also add to that that part of that valet plan uh, would it have no parking requirements at Parcel 7 Garage. So we, we've, we've discussed with our parking operator to have all valet and going either to Dock Square or up State Street to 28 or 60 State, as Justin mentioned, that we will not need Parcel 7 Garage at all and to manage it. Okay. Well, we the hotel. Can you describe the level of that hotel in terms of the demographic? Level? We view it as a moderately priced hotel. There's what most people are calling now a limited service environment. So I think what it does is it's a high quality, brand new hotel with a lot of amenities, but what you're cutting out is that thing that I hate the most, which is when I show up at the door, I got one guy grabbing my brag, he takes it three feet, I gotta give him one tip, we go to the next, etc. And we've heard consistently through the city, through Rooney, at the convention center and all this, that you need to target a moderately priced, three plus star, however you wanna call it. And we think that that's what can be done here. And we actually think that that's a compliment to the people that we'll have as guests and visitors. Mm -hmm. We think it'll be families, we think it'll be business travelers, and we think it'll be people who basically wanna participate in the city and come there and be able to do it, but be able to do it at a rate that's in line with a more common reach for people to get to. Uh, it looks as though the sight lines from the north end are being preserved. Um, there is a second, you have a, a one story and then it goes up a little to a second story and then, and then your uh, high rise. Uh, do you have a, uh, uh, an innovation, I guess, showing uh, what would be blocked and what would not be blocked by Robert Robert with a model? Yeah, that would be helpful. I think the nice thing uh, with this model is that if you're looking at Salem Street coming up here, you really have a view all the way through. That you're really not uh, blocking. And I think, in fact, we're sort of revealing those pieces. There's the one-story market area, the community room, which is sort of really this little jewel that's there, and and the deck off the community room, so that there it's useful, so inside and outside space. If you're looking straight across, which is here, you still have up Hanover Street, you would have more historic <coughs> buildings, and not the, the, the one-story buildings that are there. Thank you. <laughs> also, Dan? Yeah, you know, explain a little bit about how you envision the rooftop uh, function area working in a public viewing, and would the general public be allowed to go there free of will, or would that be just during? times that it's utilized in the function space? No, it is, I guess the first piece of the fundamental premise is that that is an open space that's available to the public that will be serviced by an elevator separate from the guest elevator. Um, people who would be coming to a function would use that same elevator, but there will not be necessarily anything locked off or blocked off. We view it as a similar, I mean, it, it will be a food and beverage operation, but it will be more consistent with what you would see in a hotel for functions 
for daytime events, for nighttime events, for weddings, for all of those components is right now this is how we see it. So that's kind of the nature, but it's not exclusive, oh, if you do an event, you can get there. If not, you can't. Anytime that it's not being used, you're going to see probably as many hotel guests and residents and people in the area up there as we would expect to, to be, you know, actually, we'd probably expect more people to be there that aren't hotel guests, actually. And that's the goal of the way we've incorporated the combination of the two-story winter garden, the transfer up to the seventh floor, and then having that community space over on the second floor in combination with a private, or I should say, a direct access to that community room. So it is really with the purpose of being for the community as much as the hotel. Does that mean? Point. Kind of going off Danny's point, um, noise is always an issue in the North End as well as part of the city. Um, with regard to the roof deck, do you envision any sort of uh, you know live music component or anything like that going in to that part of the uh, building? I, I think again, we're focusing on more as a function space than a sort of a, uh, a food and beverage you know restaurant you know late late restaurant operation. More one that supports the hotel, so. It, it's more of a passive space. The greenway is more of a passive space for people to view the greenway. But, um, but in fairness, I think we also have that space is a 9,000 square foot space. So if you were going to do an event, the food and beverage buyer environment would be in your, your music and those pieces would most likely be done inside that space. So your issues about containing noise, containing, we don't anticipate bands being out on the greenway. That's when you kind of leave the heaviness and you want to go out and relax and look at the stars, you want to have a drink and you want to kind of settle down outside of the space. Or at least that's where I am most of the time at a wedding, but um, that's just my personal preference. But to that end, I think in the same focus, we have understood it and I think even noise in the overall in our plan, which is why we created a two-story buffer also for our guests because we understand we need to manage that too. And from that end, when we looked at it, our first two floors along the market area create a significant buffer because that's retail on the ground floor and all community open space, public space for hotel guests and community center. So that way you've created a buffer. We could get into our values on windows and all those other things that we need to do, but they're interoperable, heavy R values. We've addressed, we think, both a combination of impact on the community and impact actually on our guests. So at the end of the day, everybody's happy. Thank you. Also, yeah, I, I don't know, um, but I don't know very much about what do I follow the hotel market, but um, I'm wondering what your research projections, which I'm sure you've done, show about this kind of a hotel, moderate, three-star plus, et cetera, going forward, since obviously everyone wants um, a project in this location to be successful. So in terms of the use and kind of what, what you all see professionally as a, as a uh, kind of I think maybe I'll take this kind of in combination, but I think right now if you look, Boston's 2012 projections are the strongest that they've been in at least a decade, basically as far as rent growth. When we say rent, it's EDR, average daily rate, and occupancy. We're expected to be in the mid-80s. Um, if you looked at most communities out there, most major cities other than maybe New York City and San Francisco, average occupancies are probably in the 75% range in a good and healthy market. We also know that we've got the convention center adding additional demand. They're talking about needing an additional 5,000 a night a year. We're talking about rates that we think are going to be very strong. We can tell you we've actually been contacted by quite a few of the groups that would like to do this with us. And in addition, JLL, just as another resource, has one of the best hospitality investment and sales group. And we spent a lot of time with that gentleman who's helped us out at the Ames, named Rob, uh, Bob Webster, who runs that group on is this viable, is it financeable, is the equity there, can we build it, and then we've got the beauty of a construction team from JLL that understands this project and it just happens that a gentleman named Mike Lamp here had actually worked for Jacobs Engineering and understands in detail what was constructed underneath. So we understand when we say we're going to build a six-story building, the foundations are going to work, the design is going to work, and we understand the history and the elements of what was set to create, in essence, a pad for development product. Great. Can I see the captain? See, I never got to answer questions in school because I was always afraid of the back of the bathroom. I'm sorry. I'm going to go back to Owen and Justin. 
On page 23, you show on your map, you show a lot of retail space. What's the intent of that retail space? Are you intending on incorporating some of the uh, storefronts we have on Blackstone Street? Uh, and then you talked about function rooms. I thought function rooms were something you, you weren't interested in. Well, function rooms on the top floor, on the ninth floor space. That's ninth function. floor? So, yeah, on the ninth floor. On the seventh floor. Seventh floor. Seventh floor. Seventh Sorry, floor. our top floor. <laughs> parcel yeah, nine. I'm adding parcel <laughs> nine. I'm adding. Sorry. No. That top floor on above the sixth floor of the building is the function space. I think when we say function space, we mean meeting space, resource for hotel guests, etc. That's on the second floor. The ground floor is strictly retail. In our mind, market quite uses. frankly, market uses, small boxes, 900 square feet, 1,100 square feet. Not looking to get national retailers, looking to get specialty food shops that complement, in essence, the produce that's delivered. At the end of the day, from what Robert said, is we all want to be able to walk down, grab our fruit, grab our meats, grab our cheeses, and be able to return home. And that should be a complete circle, in my mind, of the culinary element that you can take in. <coughs> Bring it home, and you have every element you need, and it's a one-stop destination for being able to fulfill that. So you're talking with the cheeses and the yes. cheese shop, wine oh, shop, right. provision shop, you know, the, the specialty. I mean, get your cheese, your olives, your cured meat, all of those pieces. And again, if you look at the spaces, they're not big boxes. I mean, your normal average retailer is looking at a national level or know that it's going to be a much larger space. The opportunity would be there, though, for the, for the yes. store oh, owners. Yes, yeah. absolutely. I mean, to, yeah. That, that's our goal, and, and, and it's supposed to be complementary to the Haymarket and complementary to Parcel 9, not competitive. We see those smaller units being similar to the North End experience and what we found on Blackstone Street and absolutely could accommodate them. Uh, one, one more thing. I know I'm nitpicking here, but you show 3,500 square feet of uh, storage. What do the, uh, the compactors take up? The compactors take up roughly, you know, a half of that space. The four self-contained trash compactors. Probably about twelve hundred. Yeah, probably but around twelve hundred. Yeah. So I think it would be maybe yeah, three hundred square foot of compactor. Yeah. So get and, then, and then there's the office space, and then there's a storage space, and the office space is you know relatively small, and there's the public bathrooms there. There's also potential for additional storage in the basement potentially. We're just, just focusing the on the ground floor at this point. Yeah. You said this. There could no, be two down below. There could be in the base potential for additional storage as we understand the demand. Okay. Thank you. Anything else, Alvin? I want one last run by the committee and then I'll open it up to the public. Paul? No, no, okay. Anybody else on the committee? Victor? Right. Yeah, two questions. The first, a mundane question, and then I'm going to go mundane. The mundane one is that the, uh, uh, the guidelines called for public restrooms. Did you provide that? Yes, we did. Okay. The non-mundane question is, um, what should we see when we look at the surface treatment that you uh, provided? Um, tell us about it. Tell us why you think it's appropriate, why you think it's, uh, it's beautiful, if you think so. You mean oh, the level? Is that? Is look at page the surface treatment, uh, page 41, the surface treatment of the uh, elevator. Oh, yeah. So. yeah. Well, so we, I think on the architectural um, design, it's, it's really to take a look at what is the scale, the character, and the components that make the north end interesting. There's red brick, eight foot proportioned windows, verticality to the building, and a play of light and shadow. We want to do all that, except we want to do it in a, in a, in a modern medium. And so what we're proposing is that, that all those components are there. So the, the windows, the punch window fenestration, sits behind a screen, it's a terracotta screen, these are vertical terracotta um, splines that as the sun is up on the east and moves to the south and the west, the shadow will totally change what the uh, facade is looking like. At nighttime, the lights will come on and there's a it's varied pattern looking at this building as if you were looking at the other side. Um, and then what we are doing is proposing that the, the ground floor be as transparent as it can be and allowing each of the uh, vendors and retailers to sort of uh, decorate and, and describe their wear that the building was not quite trying to do that. And on the back side, we're setting it back eight feet so that we have the ability to move uh, all the way around all the other uh, cars. Mm -hmm. So the architecture is there to sort of create 
at, a, at one scale, a very large scale because of the size of the greenway. And then on the flip side, something that's a little bit more broken down as a part of Blackstone block with facets and changes. Mm -hmm. And the terracotta is a brick color? The terracotta is a, is a, is a red brownish color. Right? So in a way, you have a very comfortable and familiar tone. It just happens to be in a material that's that's a little more interesting and new and slightly different, so you're not just being replicative of what is there. Thank you. Yep. Any other, anybody else on the committee? Um, okay, so I'm going to open it up to the public. Um, just one reminder, I should have been said at the beginning. Um, we, there are, we will not be asking the team to address any finance-related questions. So that's, um, I said that at the beginning of the last one. I haven't seen it. So any finance-related questions, uh, Money related rents, etc., they will not be responding to um, in the public forum. So, I'm just going to kind of go from left to right. I'll start in the back of the room and then move forward. So you raise your hand, and then when I call on you, state your name and where, you, where you're from, and then ask your question and have you respond. So, anybody back row? Next, anybody? Anybody? <laughs> Good. Okay, we have one question. You call for a public monthly. Who you are and where you're from, please? Oh, Skoll, Bob Skoll from Commercial Street. You. you talk about public market, uh, with very selling cheese and meat and vegetables, fruit and so on. That's exactly the same thing that they're having at, at Parcel 7. That's the farmer's market, now called the public market, that the governor and the mayor have decided on. What? How do, you, how do you expect all these cheese shops to exist in, in this area? I think what we're trying to do the best is the three-legged stool, which is Haymarket, Parcel 7, and Parcel 9, and how all those market uses work best. And we don't want to compete with Haymarket. We don't want to compete with Parcel 7. We want to be something different. And so I think we need to work that out. It's a great question of how that comes together in the best mix of market uses. So we would we would make adjustments as necessary to, to not have a competitive or overdone use. You're talking to Geist and the team at the, yeah. for the parcel seven. It's our understanding that that is fish, other water. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm gonna respond to that. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's a process that needs to be worked out between the three parties as it evolves, the parcel public market, the parcel seven, and exactly what those uses will be and how best to complement them. So we wouldn't look to compete again, and we wouldn't look to repeat. But we, but we, but we do intend to have uses that we think are what we've described, which are smaller venue operations, similar to the North End, that would um, complement Parcel 7. And we've had outreach and discussions with them and, and give them a sense of what we were presenting, and they have not actually viewed it as anything negative or in competition. They actually view it as a synergy, and as I think Eamon says, we would look to iteratively work with them to make sure that we weren't marketing directly against what they were looking to do, but that we could complement it. But with the amount of activity that's going to be created by the market itself, we think there will be plenty of demand. And, and again, the demand is, in our approach, small spaces. You want to make it financially affordable for people who are looking to deliver provisions in these elements to be able to be in place and to not have to take a 10,000, 8,000, 5,000 square foot product. And that first floor is only is 10,000 square feet of retail. So it is really fairly small, probably less than a percent of what the North End could be. Um, and I think Parcel 7 is much, has a much larger piece, uh, as well as the existing Blackstone block uh, retailers. So it really sort of to nestle in between what the other, what the other uh, retailers can do, and, and as Eamon says, really working with them, and I think within the entire plan, working with the other uh, components to understand how we can best create a lively market in all cases. And if we had to switch to kitchen wares or to other elements that were an enhancement of that, I mean, we looked at the spectrum of what's available, so kitchen ware, specialty items for cooking, et cetera, that that may be an extension if when we got into it further with the market, the yeah, market association, they felt we, we were competing against. Somebody else? Sure. Uh, Robert Rivers with the uh, Bostonian Hotel. A couple of questions. One would be first that uh, Faneuil Hall has struggled for years with um, independent, privately owned retail operations. 
Uh, and their original intentions when they opened Faneuil Hall was not to invite in any major well-known names as far as entities, but they had to do that to survive. How are you going to maintain that small business operator in a space that may be too expensive to operate? Well, I think first it goes to the size of those units. Okay. To understand being the whole, you're talking about big box spaces. What's happened with it over the time is they've been left with large scale spaces, the second floor spaces at a 10,000 square foot space at a rent that's justified because it's the tourist mecca of the city of Boston. And that's a different element in which we're doing. We're doing small spaces that if you took the rent per square foot and looked at it, it is a viable option and should be convert. And then we're also going to be very deliberate that our goal is not in the smaller shops and elements of Faneuil Hall that are driven by t-shirt sales and other elements. This is true to be the authentic complement of the food district and work with it. So that's our approach. But at the end of the day, it's as Robert said, it's done by design in both limiting the spaces and how we would market it, and at the end of the day, making it for that reason affordable. But I think we probably, in our total retail, are about as big as the one gap space and maybe maybe a little bit of the Banana Republic next door at the end of the day. And then in a hotel environment, hotel companies, as we know, in a strong market like Boston, will it capture two or three years of very successful revenues. And then as hotel companies, investors, and developers, we're notorious for then selling that asset for profit. How do you going to preserve what your intentions are today if a sale was to happen? Um, I, 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 would, I would start with the, the, the HPA pieces, which are important parts of the puzzle, are going to probably be fixed in place and some sort of long-term agreements, certainly for those operations. And then I think the merchandising plan with the market <coughs> Uh, we'll also probably work in leases for those, and that, that intention will be built out as long as possible. Um, I, I think back to your earlier point, you know, the, the hotel piece is such an engine for the project in a sense that we look at it as a way to help create the market on the ground floor that is <coughs> intended in the market district plan, and to provide the public benefits for Blackstone Street, and to provide the improvements of Haymarket that cost money and are important, and to underwrite that operation. So. I think in some cases there can be agreements that are longer term, and in other cases it's really about the, the energy of the hotel to help that. In terms of uh, longer term but, but, commitments but around the hotel, it's, it's a good I think question. It's at the end of the day, is I mean, it would be first of all the question you're asking is how do we fix economic cycles, which I don't think any of us can. <laughs> Second thing I would say is there's a lot of people who have developed projects, turned them over to bad owners, and in the third cycle, good owners have come. I mean, you're never going to be able to provide for that everybody's there. You're never going to be able to provide for an economic cycle. This hotel is sized at 180 unit, at 180 keys. Well, based upon the market demand we perceive, particularly based on what we've done on our own analysis. Two, we think that the moderately priced means that we're going to capture a very good amount of that pool and that we're going to be able to survive. And it's automatically at the beginning not been priced to have to capture the top of the market. So overall, we think we've at least created, and quite frankly, if you look at the institutional investment community, they are driven towards limited service because basically profit margin, the elements that go into labor and all components have been efficiently developed. Whether that changes over time, I'm not sure, but it comes down to a pretty well built out model as far as revenue, cost, and what comes to the bottom line. Fixing long term cyclical natures of the economy, you know, but, I think but it takes it takes the pressure off of that ground floor area to perform aggressively. You know, in other words, it, it, it allows us that flexibility to make the commitments and the investments that we've shown and we will do and to try to maintain that market as we plan. And the one last piece is a couple of those groups that would be the potential flags. And I'm not saying any one of these, but you know, a flag meaning a Marriott, a Hyatt, a Hilton, have reached out to us, are very interested, and are willing to make a significant investment in the hotel. That means their investment is likely to last the duration of a franchise agreement, which as you know, could be 10, could be 15, could be 20 years. So there probably is still an element of stable ownership at least in part over the time, even if we as developer over time elected to fold out the transaction. Thank you. Anybody over here? And a couple of questions. Um, one, can you? Oh, sorry. I know who you are. But sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jeanette Herman, uh, Beacon Hill. Thank you. Uh, thank you. 
Um, on the ground floor, what proportion do you envision of that space being uh, used for restaurant or cafe use? Right corner. I think about that's that corner. 4,500 feet from yeah. And that's, that's a three meal restaurant that really supports the hotel. So it will be a, a true public restaurant, but our, our idea is to have go guests out go out to the to the market and go out to the to the north end to the restaurant. So our, our hotel is a required uh, the restaurant is sort of a required element of the hotel, about 4,500 square feet, three meal restaurant. On the ground floor. On the ground floor. Okay, and um, I also see I, I I like the way you describe the connections through the building. I think they're really interesting. Do you envision um, an entrance from uh, the Hanover Street end, the narrow end, um, and can you describe the linkages, if any, to Quincy Market and the uh, Freedom Trail? Um, okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, specifically to answer your question, there is an entrance at the Hanover Street end um, where we have our community room. And we'll have a, a separate marquee there with a separate elevator uh, and stair so that that space can be accessed similar to a meeting like this and not have to go through the hotel for that. Um, no. Okay, so here uh, the question is whether there's a connection that can go through here. Uh, yes, we're seeing that as open and we're seeing sort of probably uh, tables and chairs that would really be for the public coming from this side. And then also letting that run all the way through where the market sections are working off of that area, uh, connecting here. Blackstone Street connecting to the crossover to Faneuil Hall. And just really, I just find it amazing. Just think of this as not just a, a freedom trail, but as a food trail. And that you're going, you're, you're having lunch, you're having a cafe, you're coming back, you're buying your produce, uh, you may do some shopping, and then you go home. And as Justin was saying, really a real 360 degree culinary uh, experience. And then the connections across are through the Winter Garden. Uh, they just coincide with the pathways that are on the uh, North End Park here. And then, in a way, splitting the, the more purely open space where we're seeing much more of a push cart activity from what would be more of interior booths and, and built-off shops. You know, and again, coming from Vita Hill down to that point, there will be, there'll be entrances all around the property. And that's part of the whole idea of the, pro of the project is the vertical access throughout the, the truly public spaces, which are throughout the property. The hotel is really a 100% facility of public accommodation in that sense. Hanover Street entrance point goes in and can transverse straight through into the winter uh, garden and then through the market spaces and then exiting other different points on the Greenway or directly onto North Street. Thank you. John. Uh, John McQueen, uh, Walk Boston. And this isn't a walking question. Uh, in terms of some of the community space and things and on the theme of energy, what's your vision for the programming and the uses and timing of those and what you may have for that? Well, I, mean, I, I think one, one thing that's very important about those community spaces and it was addressing a, earlier points is some of those are sort of neutral uses too on the second form. We think that's important for sort of a, a respectful presence on the Greenway. So they're active spaces, but they're not overly active. So those community uses, we see them as meeting space, community meeting, there's fitness, there's an indoor pool, we can talk about some collaboration on that. But really they're about, the hotel is a 24 seven space, I and mean, there's no lock on the front door of a hotel really. So you can, you, I don't know if you're answering your question, but you're able to access the second level to meeting space and, and functions. Yeah, but I think the meetings, there's a combination. There's probably a community center, right. which we have as a defined entrance, separate entrance, which we would envision participation of the community of who needs. Is it potentially the Boy and Girls Club? Is it potentially the, you know, some type of a program for CPR? Is it a meeting like this? Um, you know, we feel that that space is largely to be available, I mean, the hotel will use it periodically, but as in that same context, go up to one more floor. That's it. Nope. No, it's up to another floor. floor. This one, dude. So what we're saying is there's an entrance, right? There you go. Cross through us. There's an entrance, separate sign, separate stair, separate elevator, uh, so that you really can take advantage of that. And a deck that's off of it, so it's, it can be seen in a, in a wide range of uses. And that, uh, Pool and fitness center, that's part of the hotel? That, that's, that's part of the hotel. I mean, the fitness we center, man, size is all you can do. No, no, no. The hotel, um, hotel, I'll call it strictly. You know, no third party operator, no fitness center. 
Other questions? Anybody in the front? Back on this side? Come on once. Come on twice. Okay. Any last call on the committee? Any other questions from the committee? Danny? One question on the uh, public circulation area that's highlighted in yellow on the ground floor. Do you have a plan of you know, how to keep that safe and secure late in the evening? <coughs> that push the market social credit association is not operating and the retail shops closed because the activity at that point the room could be from the third floor and up. Right. Uh, you know, there's a lot of activity in that area late at night. Well, I think what we're seeing is, uh, and this is what the, the use as a public hotel is that the hotel, the, the lobby spaces, the open spaces, which we're seeing are really part of this area, the restaurants, and then down through uh, the market are public spaces and will be observed. So there'll be people that are working through there. I think that we will have to sort of think about well, when do these close, do these close at six, and is it enough, uh, an enjoyable place to walk down? You certainly could close the, some doors off so that we could isolate that so it's just not continually open. Um, this end could be much more of an open public area, that could be as well. So I think those are some details that would really be helpful to, I think you've asked a good question that we haven't got to talk about. Robert, you're right. I mean, just in general conversations with some operators, et cetera, I think at the end of kind of the service period for the retailers, whether that's six, seven, eight, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock at night, you would then see the activity kind of shut down on that, contain certain areas that you wanted to, but still have quite a bit of available space between the winter garden, et cetera. And as Robert says, I mean, through the management, you have a 24-hour security staff. You have all of the people who would be working at the hotel, who at any hotel are basically doing their rounds, doing their circulation for both securing guests. And that's what we think is a big benefit on this. I mean, this creates an element where you have a staffed environment who's going to be looking at the asset, but also eyes on the greenway, mm -hmm. eyes on the area, and that's a staff that's on there 24-7. Yeah. And I think working with the community to see how you can use this facility. So they're, I mean, they're going to be on, they're going to be on site. So there's, how can we make the lobby much more of an interesting space? And we've got some ideas on the retail. How can we, what are those group activities that you would like to do? How can we make the fitness and the um, pool usage something that's interesting? It's not an Olympic sized pool by any means. Certainly it's a, it's a, it's a small <coughs> pool or the roof deck. All these things which are really exciting opportunities. We just have to think from a management side and then I think from a community side, what, what are the best uses so it's a it's really attractive, comfortable, lively place. What we like on that is as the community, you will have a kind of single point of contact. That GM, you know, like Robert, who does a great job in, at his hotel from the millennium, in his interface with the staff, with the people, with the community, that's the same way. I mean, most hospitality, most hotels are built on a fundamental of being a participant in the community, being a, being a donor, being a provider, being a resource. And I think at the end of the day, yeah, we hope to, you know, in many ways work, you know, much the way Robert has with the community and to build upon that. So, on that end, that would be the way we look at it. But it's great to have a single point of contact that staff 24 hours that the community knows it can get to. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.